Yes, our subject is the Messiah. Will you take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm chapter 2. Our Jewish friends greet us on the Shabbat with Shabbat Shalom, but it's only the Prince of Peace who can bring, bring Shalom, true Shalom to our hearts. Sometimes we say in a Messianic assembly, uh, Baruch Hashem Adonai Elohim Yeshua HaMashiach, Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus, our Messiah. In Psalm chapter 2, it is very, very clear that this is the issue of all issues. As a matter of fact, some folks ask me the question, do you have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah in order to be saved? And the answer is absolutely. There's a couple thousand guys down in Mexico named Jesus and they can't save you. Hello. <laughs> Psalm chapter 2, please. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. Now will you turn please to one passage in the New Testament, John chapter 20. The Gospel of John, Yochanan writes in chapter 20, about the importance of believing that Jesus is the Messiah. On the internet, the Jewish websites, the two questions that receive the most activity, one, who is a Jew? And the second one, who is the Messiah? Interestingly, on those Jewish sites, the sub-question to who is the Messiah, which is asked most frequently, is, is Yeshua the Messiah? Is Jesus the Messiah? Interesting, people are asking it more today than ever in the history of the world as we understand it and the information has come to us. In John 20, 30 and 31, John who knew Jesus better than probably anyone did, he said many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written, the ones that he did write about, that ye might believe that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Yes, it's absolutely absolutely essential that you believe that Yeshua, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, it's absolutely essential that you believe that he is the Messiah in order to be saved. Will you join me please in a moment of prayer as we begin. Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful word. And we realize that these are very critical times. And prophetically we're drawing near to that sweet day when we'll be home. But we realize that there are so many in this world who have yet to bow the knee to him. But we recognize that whether we believe or not, all will bow the knee to him and all will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it is our sincere desire that we do it now that we might enjoy eternity with him. 
And Father, I pray that you'd move upon our hearts as only your Holy Spirit can do, and you would draw us to true, genuine faith, that we'd be born again of the Spirit of God and be made ready for heaven. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In the blessed name of our Messiah, our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. The subject that we're going to deal with, the prophecies of the Messiah, we've broken into four uh, categories that I want to give them for you at this present time, and uh, you can follow with us in our series. We're going to talk, first of all, about the existence of the Messiah in biblical history. Was he here and active here? Was his presence really here on planet Earth uh, previous to the time that uh, we read in the New Testament Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We're going to talk about the existence of the Messiah in biblical history. Secondly, we're going to talk about the entrance of the Messiah into the world of humanity. That is a colossal event, and we're going to discuss that from the standpoint of what actually happened while he was here. Then third, probably the most crucial issue of all, we're going to talk about the execution of the Messiah. There are many, many people saying the Bible does not teach that uh, in the Jewish Tanakh or the Old Testament as you know it. We're going to talk about that. Number four, and finally, we're going to deal with the exaltation of the Messiah and his kingdom. The truth of the matter is your Bible is about the Messiah. In Revelation 19, also written by John, who knew Jesus, as we said, probably better than anyone else, uh, he took care of his mother until the day of her death. Both of their grave sites are still there in Ephesus today, but they are with the Lord, of course. But the interesting thing is that John wrote Revelation uh, when he was uh, exiled under Emperor Domitian, who reigned from 81 to 96 AD. And he was put on the Isle of Patmos, if you've ever visited there, and I've been there many times. It's a very desolate, rocky place, and you can see why it would be an excellent prison or a place of exile. It was there that John received this marvelous message we know as the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people, when they read Revelation, they think of it as an event. Oh, it is an event, all right, when the Lord Jesus will come out of heaven and uh, on his thigh is the name written, he's the Word of God, King of kings and Lord of lords. It is an event. But please don't misunderstand, the title of the book of Revelation is not an event. The correct title is out of chapter 1, verse 1. It's the revelation or the unveiling, the apocalypse, the disclosure of Jesus Christ. There's more about Jesus Christ in Revelation in terms of names and facts than you'll find in all of the Gospels. He's also quite different in the book of Revelation than he is uh, in the Gospels. And uh, that amazes people. There are more names given to him in Revelation than all the Gospels put together. But much of Revelation is simply a quote from the Old Testament. Uh, when I studied the book of Revelation and put a commentary together, I found 400 quotations from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Now that we have a lot of computer technology, a recent study lists 718 quotations from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. One writer says, uh, who's Jewish in background, says that it, it appears that outside of the names of the seven churches, there's hardly anything in Revelation that isn't found somewhere in the Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? My friends, we are here to talk about the revelation, the disclosure of Jesus Christ. Now, when you say Jesus Christ, that's not his first and last name. His name is Yeshua. Yahweh is salvation. Thou shalt call his name Yeshua, or the a uh, correct form is Yehoshua. We say abbreviated Yeshua. It goes into Greek as Jesus and into English as Jesus. But uh, that name, Yeshua, uh, we're, we're not giving his last name when we say Christ. We're talking about the word Messiah, that he is the Messiah, the chosen one of Israel. Now, the Hebrew word for Messiah, Mashiach, is used 39 times in the Old Testament. It's interestingly translated in English as Messiah only twice, which is found in Daniel 9, 25 and 26. Interestingly, too, in the New Testament, the word Messiah uh, only appears in John 1, 41 and John 4, 25. All the rest of the times, it's translated Christ. And that's the reason for that is Christ 
is a transliteration of the Greek word that's there in the New Testament. By the way, the Greek word is Christos, said into English, Christ. But it is translating the word Mashiach in Hebrew. If you go to a Greek Old Testament and you look up the Mashiach, which is used 39 times, in the Greek Old Testament, the word in Greek is Christos. And it's interesting that that's used five hundred and sixty-nine times in the New Testament alone. You understand Messiah is the subject of the Bible. Now, the Messiah word, Mashiach in Hebrew, or Christos in Greek, is talking about the word anointing. Now, unfortunately today, we have a lot of wacko stuff about anointing. There are guys throwing the anointing in stadiums to a section of the crowd as the people fall over. That is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the Bible actually says that every believer already has the anointing. We already have it. First John 2 is pretty clear about that. And I'll tell you one thing, if you are a true believer, you certainly have the best anointing there is, and that's the anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now this word uh, Mashiach, which we get Messiah from, Christ, uh, it's used of other people besides the Lord. For instance, in Isaiah 45, verse 1, it's used of Cyrus, king of Persia. It's also used of King David in Psalm 18, verse 50. It's interestingly used of the children of Israel in Psalm 105, verse 15. By the way, King David was called the Lord's anointed, his Messiah, ten times. And uh, it's used of our Lord himself in Psalm 2-2 that I just read that all the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one, his Hamashiach, the Messiah. Now, what I'm really fascinated about is I began to study the Messiah in detail. I've been doing this for several months, and this is the first time I've preached this. But as I began to examine it, I was curious uh, about the, the teachings of modern Judaism as they relate to the past. Uh, in modern Judaism, you, you see very little emphasis on the Messiah. As a matter of fact, the Messiah is almost like a concept or something that's happening in Israel. It's not really a person. But today, uh, modern Jewish leaders are not able to hold back the tide of interest because Jewish people all over the world are asking about the Messiah. The growth of Messianic Judaism is phenomenal. And I believe the Lord is preparing his people because he's coming back and he's going to do everything he said he's going to do, including for Israel. But I began to look at this and I said, have they changed in these 2000 years since the time Yeshua was here? And uh, boy, have they ever. As a matter of fact, uh, in going into the rabbinical writings of the past, and I'm not trying to bore you and you'll be happy to know I won't go every one of them. But uh, in going over these Jewish rabbinical writings before the time of Jesus on earth, born as a baby in Bethlehem, I found 558 specific Jewish writings that deal with the Messiah in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, I found 456 Old Testament passages that were used by Jewish rabbis before the time of Jesus to refer to the Messiah and to the Messianic times. In other words, before Jesus ever was born as a baby, Jewish rabbis saw the Messiah in more passages than any Christian Gentile teacher has ever seen. And I say hallelujah. Some of them are absolutely startling. They blow your mind. You can't hardly believe you're reading it. You've read the passage maybe many times and never saw what is there. It's very important. So let's get into our study, the existence of the Messiah in biblical history. If you're taking notes, and all spirit-filled Christians do, <laughs> hello, hello. But if you're taking notes, we're going to deal with 12 clear-cut references to the Messiah in past biblical history, before he ever becomes a baby born in Bethlehem. So let's start with number one. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Our first point is that he is the promised seed. He is the promised seed. The very word seed in past Jewish history became a term for the Messiah. Now in the New Testament, we know that's true. 
in the book of Galatians chapter three, we're clearly told that the promise of God to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob about a seed is not referring to plural seeds as many people, but is referring to one and that is Christ. So in the Jewish rabbinical writings, when they refer to the names of the Messiah, one of those clear cut names is the fact of the seed. Now in Genesis 3.15, I read this. I will put enmity between thee, now he's talking to the serpent, to Satan, according to verse 14. I'll put enmity or hostility between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, meaning her seed will bruise or crush your head. Now when you crush the head of a serpent, it's all over for the serpent, okay? The next one says, and thou shalt bruise his heel. If you're gonna get bit by a snake, the safest place, if it's a poisonous snake, is your heel. You have more time to recover. It's interesting the blow is not fatal that the serpent gives to the heel of the seed of the woman. Now, if you go to Jewish people today, uh, whether a Jewish rabbi or uh, just some Jewish friends, uh, believe me, they deal with this text because they know how the Christians do. And so they basically say, well, the seed of the woman are Jewish people and they're gonna eventually conquer through the Lord's help and defeat Satan. And there is some truth to that. So they use the seed as a plural, and unfortunately some of the English translations in translating that seed issue uh, use a plural descendants at the wrong time. Now sometimes it does refer to your descendants and refers to the children of Israel, but not here. The reason being is there are singular pronouns. Uh, he is gonna do this, not they. But when you ask the Jew, well, if, if that's the seed of the woman, if they're Jews, then who is the seed of the serpent? I had the beautiful uh, opportunity to ask six Jewish guides at a kibbutz in Northern Galilee. Uh, after everybody had gone to bed, we sat down, we were uh, talking about Bible things and they were upset with me because they said, you said that the Messiah uh, was, was clearly indicated in the book of Bereshish or you know it as Genesis by its Greek name. And I said, well, that's absolutely true. And they said, well, we, we know uh, Bereshit. We know Genesis by heart in Hebrew. And there is no mention whatsoever of the Messiah. I said, well, that can't be. And we went to Genesis 3.15. They got out Hebrew Bibles. They wanted to do it in Hebrew. I said, that's fine with me. So here we are in Hebrew. And I said, well, if, if the seed uh, of the woman, as you say, are the Jewish people who will eventually conquer, who's the seed of the serpent? They all kind of hesitate. Well, we really don't want to say. I said, well, let me tell you, because I already know what you believe. And they looked kind of shocked. I said, you believe those are the Gentiles, <laughs> the goyim. They said, oh, you know that. I said, absolutely. I said, but you guys are dead wrong on both of them. And I pointed out the fact of these singular pronouns. And it was amazing to me, knowing Hebrew so well and memorizing that book long ago in their studies, it was amazing to me that they had not noticed that the pronoun was singular, not plural. There's only one seed who's gonna crush the head of Satan. And what a wonderful passage. But you know, I, I thought to myself, is it only modern Judaism that's gone wacko on this? When I looked up the Jewish community of scholars previous to the time of Jesus, are you ready for this? As early as 300 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, this text was always understood by the Jewish rabbis to refer to the Messiah. It was the name of the Messiah, the seed of the woman. Galatians 4, 4 says, in the fullness of time, God, God brought forth a son made of a woman. The Bible is very, very clear. He's the seed of the woman. Even in Revelation 12, when we see the woman clothed with a son, and uh, the beautiful illustration is connected with Joseph's dream. She brought forth a man child. Israel brings forth uh, the Messiah. It's very clear, the seed of the woman. Now go over to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And look at verses one to three. Genesis chapter 12, verses one to three. The promised seed is not only the seed of the woman, it's the seed of Abraham, of Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verses one to three. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I'll make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, make thy name great, thou shalt be a blessing, 
I'll bless them that bless thee, curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Amen? Now, people say, well, that just means that through, you know, the Jewish people's influence throughout history, everybody's been blessed, and, you know, they're financial wizards or military strategists, or they seem to be able to make money. Uh, they are definitely better off than the rest of the people. You know, that's a bunch of baloney, folks. That is not true. Did you know the Jews die at the same rate as Gentiles? Hello. People say, well, if you ate the Jewish diet, you live a lot longer. That, that's in the Christian bookstore. No, you won't. You're going to die on time. <laughs> you know, it kind of bothers me, even after the message we just heard, which was fantastic, I got to thinking about it. Isn't it a little crazy? Of all of us working so hard, you know, with nutrition, aerobics, exercise, all this stuff, you know, with all the pills I take every day, all this stuff to be healthy, it looks like we're trying to stay out of the place we all say we want to go to. <laughs> Does that bother anybody else? I said I'm going to die on time. I say let's pork out, huh? <laughs> now nah, we should be good stewards, of course, but you understand there is something funny going on in the Christian world. Now, the Bible's very clear that the seed who's going to bless the whole world are not the Jewish people, but is the Messiah. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the New Testament begins. These are the generations, the genealogies of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is the son of Abraham. Go to John chapter 8. And let me show you why this is a problem in the New Testament. The Jewish people of that time knew exactly what Jesus was saying. He is the promised seed. Their messianic hopes were really high in the first century AD. And they knew that the seed was the Messiah. And in John chapter 8, just to prove my point, there's a very interesting little uh, interchange here with Jewish leadership. In chapter 8 of John, beginning at verse 56, you read this. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Now, I don't know how you look at that. Some people say, well, it wasn't literal. He saw it by faith. Well, I know he saw it by faith. Genesis 15, 6, he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But isn't it possible that he might have seen Jesus in a different way than you're thinking? Did he see his day? Uh, well, he saw it by faith. But my personal opinion is that uh, our Lord Jesus appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 14 by, by the, you know him by the name of Melchizedek. And Hebrews chapter 7, 1 to 10 gives us a great argument about it. He's either Messiah or he's a historical per personage who represents the Messiah. All we know that is in Psalm 110 verse 4, it says of the Messiah, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. No, the Melchizedek priesthood is not a Mormon thing. There's only one Melchizedek. It is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is so important to understand. But getting back to the seed of Abraham thing, uh, in verse uh, 56, he said, well, Abraham saw my day. He, he saw it. He was glad. The Jews said unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old. Has thou seen Abraham? I mean, Abraham lived over 2,100 years before Jesus was born as a baby in Bethlehem. So they thought he's lost his mind. Call the white coats. He's crazy. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, look at this. Before Abraham was, I not was. You know, if he said I was, it's an incredible statement, meaning I was there over 2,100 uh, years ago. I was there before he ever came into existence, Abraham. But he didn't say I was. He said I am. When Moses asked the name of the Lord in Exodus chapter 3, uh, very interesting. We call it the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. It's uh, four letters, and it basically is a verb to be that carries the idea of always there. You know, in Revelation, uh, he who once was and is and shall be. Uh, in other words, it's a word that he's always there. Uh, we heard a great definition of uh, that uh, uh, inhabiting of eternity and being above time yet in time and controlling all of time. But let me tell you something. When Moses said, when they asked me, what is your name? What will I say? What he said to him was, I am that I am. 
Now, there are two ways to look at that. One, he gave him a real theological discourse to think about for a few years in the wilderness. Or what he said was the most obvious thing in Hebrew. Whoever I am, I still am, regardless of what you know or understand. And by the way, you never will understand who I am. Hello. It's a name above every name. And his name is wonderful. Doesn't mean fantastic like our English word wonderful. It's a Hebrew word for incomprehensible. His greatness is past finding out. His ways are past finding out. We're talking the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My blessed Lord Jesus, nobody needs to be mentioned in the same line, in the same breath with my Lord. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's the Holy One of Israel. And no one but him deserves to be praised and glorified. We need to get this straight. Something's wrong in people's thinking. He's the seed of Abraham. And they immediately knew what he said because they pick up stones to stone him. Jews do that for blasphemy. They knew right away he was equating himself with a Yahweh of the Old Testament and his Messiah. By the way, all rabbinical teachers have said for years what Jehovah Witnesses will deny at your door, that the Messiah is never called Yahweh in the Old Testament. Yet all the Jewish rabbi teachers before Jesus always said the Messiah is Yahweh. He's Yahweh of armies. The Bible's very clear. You got two Yahweh's in the same verse in Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, the King of Israel, all JWs say that's the Father, and his Redeemer, everybody knows the Redeemer's the Messiah, but it calls him the Lord of hosts. Ask a JW to explain it, here's what he'll say. There are two words in Hebrew, Yahweh for the Father, and Adonai, which is an earthly Lord. Uh, like in Psalm 110, when David uh, speaks about his Lord, he uses Adonai. Is Jesus an earthly Lord? Yes. But here's the interesting point. In Isaiah 44, 6, it's not Adonai, the second word, it's Yahweh. We got two Yahwehs in the same verse. Thus saith Yahweh, King of Israel, and Yahweh, Lord of hosts, there is no God beside me. Is everybody still with us? I, I want to be careful. I was in a conference recently and a guy was there for the first time. It was uh, some athletes. And um, uh, this guy was a former player in hockey and he uh, also was a, um, a coach of the Atlanta Flames for a while and a broadcaster. And some of you might know his name. He was in several of those beer commercials that you don't watch, but you know, you heard about. Anyway, his name was Boom Boom Jeffreyon, and he was in this conference, and it was the first time he heard anybody teaching the Bible. And so he came up to me after I was over. In fact, he stormed down the aisle. He was so mad. I said, what's the matter? He says, there is no book of facts. I stopped for a moment. I realized the first reference I had was Acts. He had been hunting the entire time for the book of facts. I do give a lot of references, so I'm sorry. But uh, try to catch up or get the tape or something else or ask the guy sitting next to you who probably doesn't know either. <laughs> he is the promised seed. In Genesis 17, verse 19 and 21, 12, we learn he's not only the seed of Abraham, he's the seed of Isaac. We learn in Genesis 28, verse 10, verse 14, he's the seed of Jacob. Folks, make no mistake about it. The one who's going to bless the entire world, all goyim, all nations of the entire world. The promised seed is the Hamashiach. He is the Messiah. Number two, turn to Genesis chapter 49. You say, man, at this rate, when are we going to get out of here? Oh, about midnight. <laughs> Hang on. Genesis chapter 49. You say, what about the existence of the Messiah in biblical history? Well, he's the promised seed, that's for sure. Number two, he is the Shiloh who will come. He is the Shiloh who will come. Genesis 49, Jacob has called his sons together, the heads of the 12 tribes, and he's giving them uh, his prophetic message about the last days. In verse 8, he speaks about the fourth son, of Leah, and that fourth son, whose name means praise, is the one to whom the Messiah comes, Judah, Judah, the southern kingdom after Israel was divided. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Play on words there, Judah means praise. 
Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, as an old lion who shall rise him up, rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Hebrew idiom for coming out of the womb of a woman. Until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal unto the vine, his ass is cold unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. An interesting, interesting prophecy. Now the word Shiloh uh, is simply a Hebrew word put into letters to make it a proper name. And there's been a debate throughout history as to whether it's a proper name or not. Because if I translate it, uh, it really says, Unto he, until he comes to whom it belongs. Uh, what's the it? The it is the scepter, uh, indicating royalty and kingship. So until he comes to whom it belongs. We also learn in these verses that the tribe of Judah will not cease to exist as a people until he comes. Well, I remind you that 10 northern tribes were put into captivity a long time ago. Judah was still present in the land when Jesus was here. Uh, Judah apparently is going to have a government of its own until the Messiah comes. In the Targum of Ancalus, a Jewish writing, it says, until Messiah comes. In the Jerusalem Targum, it reads, until the time that King Messiah shall come. Rabbi Johanan asked what was the name of the Messiah, and those in the school of Rabbi Shiloh answered, his name is Shiloh, according to that which is written, until Shiloh come. Now, I'm quoting these ancient Jewish rabbis, not because I'm, I'm trying to say they're equal with the Bible. They're not. All it's doing is simply demonstrating, folks, that the current situation uh, in Judaism of saying things that, you know, almost make this whole issue secular are far from where the Jewish people were in terms of what they heard from their rabbis long before Jesus ever came. Shiloh was and still is the name of the Messiah. He is the one to whom the scepter belongs. He is, according to the Bible, from the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, 5 makes it clear he is the lion, which is the symbol of the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's our Lord. He's from Judah. Joseph was from Judah. Mary was from Judah. Bethlehem was in Judah. My dear friends, this is pretty important because it tells us how to narrow down who the Messiah is. Step by step, it is clarifying there's only one possibility. Let me just give you another um, little insight. If you read the Bible carefully, like in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, when the messenger of the covenant comes, and uh, the Lord will come suddenly to his temple, which is quoted in the New Testament, you realize that um, the Lord Jesus, or the Messiah, whoever he was, had to come before the second temple was destroyed. You say, what are you talking about? Well, because Malachi wrote after the first temple was destroyed. But says the Lord will come suddenly to his temple, which is used in the New Testament of our Lord Jesus. So now we have a real interesting situation. Uh, I've been discussing with a rabbi in the Southern California area on the internet. We were discussing about the identity of the Messiah, and he's upset that a lot of his people are listening to me on the radio. And so he's bound determined to prove to me that Yeshua is not the Messiah, not the Hamashiach. Well, we've been going down step by step, sort of what we're doing with you. And as a result, uh, he's now in a trap because he admitted to me that it appears that the Messiah had to be here before the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. He's admitted it. Then he quickly realized that he's now in a trap. So he wrote me and he said, just in an email, just a little quick, Marty, this is kind of Jewish humor, but he wrote and he said, uh, there is one other possibility and never said, of course, it makes you write back. So I wrote back and said, all right, what's the other possibility? And he wrote back and he said, he could have had a twin brother that did everything he did. <laughs> now that's a Jewish humor of saying, I'm in a trap and I can't get out and I want this discussion to end. He's the promised Messiah, he is the Shiloh. Number three, he's also 
Turn to Numbers chapter 24. He is the star who comes out of Jacob. I just read a fascinating analysis. Have you ever seen that uh, Jewish star we sometimes call Magan David, uh, the star of David? Um, if you go to Israel, you'll see the Jewish star uh, engraved on the ruins of the synagogue at Capernaum. It's on, a, uh, on the floor now. A top uh, piece was, um, you know, knocked off in an earthquake. It's down on the floor, and, and the Jewish guides will always point, there's the first evidence of the star. Well, that's a, a synagogue from the time of Hadrian in the second century AD. Well, I just read a fantastic, interesting article uh, by Jewish leadership on the star. And where'd that come from? Why is it a symbol on the Jewish flag today? It is absolutely unbelievable because they said it is very possible they have evidence of the presence of the star as a symbol long before uh, the time of the destruction of the temple and the building, uh, rebuilding process under uh, Hadrian in the second century. They said it's very, very possible that the star had something to do with the Messiah. Now watch this. Numbers chapter 24. Everybody get there? Chapter 24 numbers. Look at verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh or near. There shall come a star out of your cove, out of Jacob, and a scepter, there it is again, same thing as Genesis 49, 10. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom will be a possession and Israel will do mightily. And verse 19, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. He's the star who comes out of Jacob. By the way, just to show you that this was a messianic symbol, uh, at the time of the um, Bar Kokhba revolt uh, in AD 132, it was suppressed by the Romans, but it was a very valiant attempt by the Israelis to overthrow the Roman government. And they were always looking for that, even at the time of Jesus. But the man who led that revolt, his full name is Simon Bar Kokhba, which means Simeon, son of the star. And they actually believed that he was the Messiah who would deliver them. It turned out he was not. In the Sohar, which is a Jewish document, it says concerning Numbers 24, and I read literally, this star is the Messiah. So now we've learned so far, he's the seed of the woman. He is Shiloh who uh, is going to come and receive the scepter in the kingdom of the whole world. And he is the star who comes out of Jacob. I want to remind you of Revelation 22, Jesus himself is speaking. I, Jesus, am the bright and morning star. He is the star. Uh, interesting, I found in one Jewish document, they said, this is before the time of Jesus, that in our opinion, a star will come out of the east and mark the place where the star will be born. Unbelievable. Written before he ever became a baby in Bethlehem. Number four, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. The existence of the Messiah in biblical history is an absolute, unbelievable uh, matter of Bible prophecy. By the way, Bible prophecy is about Jesus. If you don't see Jesus, you better go back and look at it again. A lot of people are interested in Y2K. Hello. Look, I don't know if it's going to collapse or not. If it collapses, praise God. What an opportunity for the gospel. If you want to stock up, uh, you know, all the food and water, good, because some of us need your stuff. <laughs> I don't want to be facetious here. I think it could be a problem. I don't know if it'll be a problem. I'm not knowledgeable in the area. I've read all of the books and all that, but I love uh, Chuck Smith's remark recently. On a Sunday morning, he said, my wife, for 48 years of our marriage, brought me one bran muffin and orange juice every morning. But two, year, two, two weeks ago, there was a remarkable change. She brought me the orange juice, but she brought me two bran muffins. And he turned to her and said, why two, Kay? <laughs> His wife's name is Kay. Kay. 
I know some of you are troubled. Jesus said, don't be panicked. Even when we get into the beginning uh, sorrows of the tribulation, he says, see that you be not troubled. So let's watch out. It may be a good opportunity to share the gospel. Who knows? I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm looking for the savior. I'm not looking for Y2K to be resolved. I'm not looking for the Antichrist either. Everybody wants to know who the Antichrist is. I don't know who the Antichrist is and watch my lips. I don't care. <laughs> the coming world leader that I'm looking for is not Antichrist, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to get straight on this, folks. There's too many people, God bless you. There's too many people with their eyes on the wrong thing in terms of Bible prophecy. One guy just wrote me a note. He's a, in an organization where they have a lot of prophecy speakers. And I'm kind of a, you know, freelance, free bird type. Anyway, he wanted me to become involved with this thing. He said, there's only one problem with you, David. So we really have two things we're concerned about. I said, what's that? He said, one, you have too much Bible. I said, what's the other one? He said, well, you talk about Jesus an awful lot. You know, there are other things people want to hear. You know, I said a quick thank you to God. Thank you, Lord. I consider that a great compliment. God bless you and you'll not be hearing from me again. And I hung up, but I consider it a compliment. Let me tell you something. We need God's word. We need to know that Jesus is what's worth talking about. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords, my blessed Lord. Well, Deuteronomy 18, this is interesting. A lot of folks skip right by this, don't even see it. You see, he's not only the seed, the promised seed in the Shiloh who will come and the star who comes out of Jacob. He is the seer, S-E-E-R, the seer, the prophet who will be like Moses. Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Look at verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now the word prophet in these two verses that I've read, Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 and 18, are in what we call the emphatic position in Hebrew. Uh, what that means is they're in front of the Hebrew verb. And the point is that a single person is intended, not a line of prophets. Go to John, please, chapter 1. It's interesting that the New Testament gives us these clues all along the way about this prophecy concerning the prophet. In John 1, verse 45, is this a name of the Messiah? In John 1, 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. That passage is in a part of the law, and that is Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah. But go to chapter 4, please, verse 19. Do you remember at the well in Samaria talking to the Samaritan woman? In John 4, 19, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now look down at verse 29. She said, come see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is not this the what? Christ, Messiah. In other words, she as a Samaritan had already hooked up the word prophet with the Messiah. Go over to chapter six, verse 14. In chapter six, verse 14, I read, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, look at this. This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. John 6, 14. Yes, they did connect the prophet as being the Messiah. And they connected it right there in front of us in John 6, 14. In chapter 7, verse 40. Chapter 7, verse 40, Jesus said, this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore mur uh, answered and said to them, murmur not among yourselves. They were constantly questioning his remarks. But by the time I get over to Acts 3, I think the issue is pretty well settled. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, down to the end, Peter's preaching. His second great message recorded in the New Testament uh, after Pentecost. It says in verse 19, Peter's message, Acts 3, 
Repent ye therefore, be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now watch this, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet, quoting directly Deuteronomy 18, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him ye shall hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. You are the children of the prophets of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy sin seed, there it is again, unto all the kindreds of the earth will be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Yeshua, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. See, folks, by Acts chapter 3, they connected him not only with the seed, but they connected him with the prophet of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Isn't that exciting? In chapter 7, verse 37, in Peter's or, or Stephen's message, in chapter 7, verse 37, we read this. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Yes, they understood that prophet, that seer, who would be like Moses to be none other than the Messiah. By the way, the Messiah is both a prophet and a priest and a king, all three. Now number five, probably one of the most clear identifications of the Messiah is that he's the son of David. The son of David. Go to Psalm 89, please. Psalm 89. He is the son of David. As you know, in the New Testament, that becomes a very strong messianic issue among the Jewish people. The son of David. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that the Messiah had to be that. When Matthew began his gospel on the Messiah and the kingdom, he said, these are the generations of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua the Messiah. He called him first the son of David, and then he said the son of Abraham. That's a little startling in Matthew 1.1. I'll tell you why. Because in normal genealogy, you would place the oldest man first. It should read son of Abraham, son of David. And the question that a lot of Jews asked about the New Testament and its beginning is why did they reverse the order? They reversed the order because the emphasis is on Jesus being the Messiah, the son of David. He went on to describe the genealogies of Jesus in the first 18 verses of Matthew. And there are three uh, divisions of those genealogies. Remember that? And they each one have 14 generations in them, a total of 42. The question is, are those the exact fathers and sons? If you go back and study it in the genealogical tables and chronicles, you realize they're not. There's some big heavy duty gaps there. Then why did he list only 14 three times and then say the story of the virgin birth? And a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Why did he do it? Because Matthew in the opening chapter of the New Testament is identifying Jesus as the Messiah of Israel with that typical title that every Jew knew, the son of David. There's something more here that I haven't said that I'm getting to. Uh, Jews love to play games with letters and numbers. You know, they love it. And uh, the name David, its Hebrew equivalent in terms of numbers, is a number 14. Wasn't that interesting? Oh, by the way, the Hebrew word Mashiach is also 14. The, name of, the number of the Messiah is 14. David's name is 14. He's the son of God. That's why there are three groupings of 14. So people say, well, why did he have three? Since they're not all, all the names are there, why are there three? And the answer is, in the law, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. So you understand, even in genealogical tables, with the actual number being the number of the Messiah, it says, and now, verse 18, the birth of Jesus the Messiah is on this wise. It's a tremendous testimony to the fact that he is the Messiah, the son of David. Psalm 89, verse 20, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. How interesting. Down at verse 26, 
He'll cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. I'll make him my firstborn. Hebrews 1, 6 quotes it. Higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. My covenant shall stand with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever. His throne is the days of heaven unbelievable. Verse 35, once have I sworn by my holiness, I'll not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever. His throne is the sun before me, and so on. He's the son of David. Turn to the book of Hosea, if for no other reason to find it. <laughs> Daniel, Hosea, and look please at chapter 3. Hosea chapter 3, and look at verse 4 and 5. What a marvelous testimony to the Messiah we have in the book of Hosea, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. As a matter of fact, in the Targum, Jonathan, uh, it says, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the service of the Lord their God and be obedient to the Messiah, the son of David, their king. They agree. This refers to the Messiah. Verse 4, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. He is the son of David. And you and I both know in the Gospels it is repeated over and over again. In Matthew chapter 1, of course, he's the son of David. Chapter 21, when he comes into Jerusalem, they shout, Hosanna, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David. In chapter uh, 22, a lawyer comes to Jesus with a question, what's the greatest commandment? And we have a fantastic discussion about the Messiah being the son of David. And if he's the son of David, Jesus said, then how can David call him Lord? A fascinating discussion. The son of David is a Messiah. Number six, the sixth thing. Who is the Messiah? He's the seed, the promised seed. He is the Shiloh who will come, the star who comes out of Jacob, the seer, the prophet who will be like Moses, the son of David. But he's also the shoot or the sprout of the Lord. Turn to Isaiah chapter 4. Everybody okay? Isaiah chapter 4. We're just warming up. Isaiah chapter 4, hang in there. It's going to go pretty fast right now. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 2. Isaiah 4 verse 2. He's the shoot or the sprout. You know it in English by the word branch. Branch. It's a name of the Messiah. Uh, in Isaiah 4 verse 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And people say, well, how's that referred to the Messiah? Well, it does refer to the Messiah. In fact, in the Midrash, uh, many people who are Jewish know about the Midrash. It says, the branch here is the name of the Messiah. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, it says on the cross in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, it says in Hebrew, reading from right to left, that Yeshua uh, is the Nazarite, people say. He's from Nazareth. I, I want you to know I'm not sure about it at all. Why am I not sure about it? Well, there's what we call the Aramaic myth of the New Testament, that somehow Jesus and the disciples spoke Aramaic. You see it everywhere. It's in everybody's book. I just bought a brand new book from Barnes & Noble, and that's what they said, and all this stuff. And it's in some Bibles in the margins, but we now know different. We now know by archaeological study that Hebrew dominated the land of Israel in the first century. Jesus did not speak Aramaic. Of course, he could, but he did not. He spoke Hebrew, and so did the disciples. We now know what they denied for years, that there were no Hebrew villages in Israel. Oh, yes, there are. In fact, in the discovery of Bethsaida, there was Hebrew potter pottery, Hebrew coins, everything, which blew the whole theory of the Decapolis around the Sea of Galilee. I could go on and on. By the way, they also know now that there were Jewish Messianic villages who were committed to Jesus. Something Israel has denied, they just recently admitted, because up in the Hula Valley, uh, uh, where the waters of Morah come down to the Sea of Galilee, they found in three mounds, three Jewish Messianic villages from the first century. They now have said the New Testament is correct. Uh, the Jews of the first century evidently turned to Jesus. Hello! I'm getting excited, I tell you. I got so much here and I can't even get it all. I tell you, branch of the Lord. He is the branch. Well, on the cross said Jesus of Nazareth. I'm not sure. Why am I not sure? Because when you go back in Hebrew, you really got the word Netzer. It could be Nazareth, but it's also the word branch. It was the name of the Messiah. 
Do you remember the Jewish leaders, according to John, really were upset by what was on that cross? There's a lot of theories about it. I've given uh, one to people before that it's very possible since Jews read the first letter of each word that they saw the tetragrammaton there in the first letters. Yehoshua, a yod, uh, the branch or the Nazarene, if you want. Uh, Jesus, the Nazarene. Uh, they saw Yod, hey, and then the wa, and, like a shepherd's staff, and then Hamelech, the king of the Jews. So in the first four uh, words, in the first letters, they see Yahweh dying on the cross. Uh, even if that's not true, we do know that the Jewish leadership asked Pilate, don't leave that up there, put up there that he said that. So the word order would change and you wouldn't see it exactly the same. There's a lot of arguments about it. But it's very possible that what was up there that was disturbing them is the word netzer. That he is because the, the, when you write this in Hebrew, it is, it is so uh, fine. It's such a fine point, such a technical point. It's very possible that it was up there, Jesus the branch. And every Jew would know that the Messiah is on that cross. This is a very fascinating thing. I've talked about this to so, several of my Jewish scholar friends in Israel, and they all agree that maybe the Christians have made too much of the Nazarene. One Jewish rabbi said, I think you even have a church named Nazarene, don't you? You know, it was an interesting discussion, but anyway. Uh, the branch, go to chapter 11, please, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Wow, time's gone by. Chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and what will grow out of his roots? What does it say? A branch will grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, and so forth. He is the branch. You will also find this in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, where it calls the Messiah, the branch, the Lord, our righteousness. You'll find it also in Zechariah chapter 3 and chapter 6. And in the book of Revelation, he is called the root of David. And in chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 16, Jesus himself says that he's the root and the offspring of David. And I began to look at this a little more deeper. In the Targum Jonathan, I read this. These shall go forth, uh, these shall go forth a king from the son of Jesse, and the Messiah shall be anointed from his children's children. In the Jewish Encyclopedia, uh, uh, in uh, volume number eight, on page 506, it says the ideal king to whom Isaiah looks forward will be a son of the stock of Jesse, the Messiah, on whom will rest the Spirit of God. My friends, the more you look at this, the more you realize we've been given a snow job for years. The Messiah is everywhere in the Bible. It's what the Bible is about. And the only hope of the world is the Messiah, whether you're Jewish or you're Gentile. It's a Jewish Messiah that will save the entire world. And you must believe that this person we call Jesus is the Messiah or you're not saved. There must be something to this that we're not getting. He's not only the son of David, the shoot of the Lord. Number seven, let me go quickly. Give me just a few more minutes. He is the stone that the builders rejected. Go to Psalm 118. He's the stone. This is mentioned also in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14 where we read these words, he shall be for a sanctuary, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And that's quoted in the New Testament of our Lord. In Isaiah, uh, we have that. But uh, the one I want you to look at is in Psalm 118. We call Psalm 113 to 118 the Hallel. Uh, means praise the Lord in every language. And the Psalm 113 to 118, the Hallel, is sung by the Levitical priests at Passover every year and they're all on duty and they're all doing it. In Psalm 118 uh, verse uh, 22, it says the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it's marvelous in our eyes and this is the day, this is the day which the Lord hath made. Not today, talking about that day when he was rejected. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, that's your word Hosanna. 
Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And most all of us here know that those passages are quoted about the event we know as Palm Sunday and is repeated over and over again in the New Testament, quoted frequently in the New Testament, uh, in the writings of the New Testament by different writers. He is the stone over which people will stumble. He is a stone that becomes a rock of our salvation. He's called the rock in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Uh, the word stones used 191 times, the word rock 119 times. It became a message to the Jewish people of the salvation the Messiah would bring. Number eight, real quick. He's the servant of the Lord. He's the servant of the Lord. Go to Isaiah chapter 42. Once again, we have a great controversy among Jews in our day. They deny that this is the Messiah. I went to Rashi, probably one of the greatest rabbinical scholars of all times, and he says of Isaiah 42, all of our rabbis apply this to the Messiah. Rabbi Moses El Sheik says our rabbis with one voice interpret the servant of the Lord as the King Messiah. In Isaiah 42, here's all I read. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. These verses, by the way, are quoted in the New Testament of our Lord. He is the servant. If you go to chapter 49 of Isaiah, chapter 49, we read in the opening verses that he is the servant. Verse 5 says, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorified in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Uh, it's fascinating. When you get to chapter 52 of Isaiah, verse 13, it says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And as many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. And it leads us into chapter 53. Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He'll grow up as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness or no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected, smitten of God, afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace is upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. My Jewish friends do not read Isaiah 53 in the Shabbat, uh, Shabbat readings. The question is why? People say they're afraid it refers to Jesus. Maybe that was true, but they also read it in honor of those who died in the Holocaust under Hitler. Because today all the Jews say the servant is the Jewish people. It is in Isaiah 43, Israel is his servant. But this cannot be the Jewish people. Why? Because it's not plural. I said to my rabbi friend, I said, I want to know who that guy is in chapter 53 of Isaiah's prophecy, because whoever he is are only singular pronouns, and whoever he is, he's the only one that can save us from our sins. Please tell me who he is. For all the sin of you and me and the whole world, was laid on him. Some Jew suffered for every one of us. Some Jew was wounded for us all. Some Jew was beat up and marred beyond recognition for every one of us. Some Jew had stripes placed on him by which those stripes alone, you and I can be healed. Who is he? My friends, without belief in the Jewish Messiah, there is no hope. You see, he's not only the servant of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 34 tells us number nine, he's the good shepherd. This is quoted in John 10. He is the good shepherd who will give his life for the sheep. Why in Psalm 23, one, we all lo uh, love it. It says the Lord, Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. Jesus said in John 10, I'm the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. And, and, if, and if we go through him, he's the door also into the sheepfold and we'll find pasture and we'll be saved. Let me tell you something else about him. Number 10, he's the savior. He's the savior. 
Look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14. The Messiah, you want to know a title of him? He's the Savior. The Savior. He's the only one who will save you. Isaiah 41, 14, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now chapter 43, verse 3, and it says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. What a wonderful thing. The Holy One of Israel is the Savior. In verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, Yahweh, and beside me there is no Savior. Verse 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. When anybody tells me the gospel is not in the Old Testament, I said, there's more gospel there than you find in the New Testament. It's unbelievable. Over and over again. In chapter 44, verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Chapter 45, verse 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, that's quoted in Romans of our Lord, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. You and I both know that is said of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. What's it talking about? That he's the Savior and there's none else. There's no other God. There's no other Savior. You say, well, if you're long as you're sincere. No, you can be sincerely wrong. There is no other way. There is no other salvation. There is no other Savior. And I love in the context of prophecy, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. Very clear, Titus 2.13. He's not only the Savior, number 11, he's the Son of Righteousness, Malachi 4.2. It says the Son, S-U-N, will arise with healing in his wings. And by the way, the rabbis of the past said that this is indeed the star of Jacob. Uh, it, the sun is a star. This is indeed the light that will bring light to all the Gentiles in Isaiah's prophecy. This is the Lord, our righteousness. This is the branch. The rabbis say, that's the sun. And many people believe when Jesus said, I am the bright and morning star, that instead of getting all wacko here, it's either Numbers 25, uh, 24, the star out of Jacob, or the bright and morning star is talking about the sun coming up. From our point of view, he is the sun of righteousness who will arise with healing in his wings. And I say hallelujah. Number 12, and finally, he's also the sovereign whose kingdom will endure forever and ever. Daniel saw him coming up to the throne of God, the Father, and he came with the clouds of heaven, and a dominion, and a throne, and a kingdom was given unto him that will last forever and ever. These words are quoted in Luke 1 to Mary, to let her know that the child that will be born of her is indeed uh, the son of the highest who will be given the throne of his father David, and a kingdom that shall last forever and ever and ever and ever. My friend, listen to me. A lot of folks say all you have to do is believe in Jesus. Well, if you understood who he is, I could understand that. But if you're not clear who he is, watch out. Because the Jesus of the modern generation is not the Jesus of the Bible. We're talking about the one who's the Messiah of Israel, active in the Old Testament, came into this world, and one day is going to return, King of kings and Lord of lords. We're talking about the one who created the heavens and the earth, for all things were made by him. Without, any, without him was not anything made that was made. He is before all things, and by him all things consist and hold together. We are talking about the firstborn of all creation, the one who is to be worshiped by angels and all men and even the demons of hell. We are talking about the one to whom the entire universe belongs and all of its people. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And I ask you, have you bowed the knee to him? Because there is no hope apart from him. Let's pray. in biblical history. 
Was he here and active here? Was his presence really here on planet Earth uh, previous to the time that uh, we read in the New Testament Jesus was born in Bethlehem? We're going to talk about the existence of the Messiah in biblical history. Secondly, we're going to talk about the entrance of the Messiah into the world of humanity. That is a colossal event, and we're going to discuss that from the standpoint of what actually happened while he was here. Then third, probably the most crucial issue of all, we're going to talk about the execution of the Messiah. There are many, many people saying the Bible does not teach that uh, in the Jewish Tanakh or the Old Testament as you know it. We're going to talk about that. Number four, and finally, we're going to deal with the exaltation of the Messiah and his kingdom. The truth of the matter is your Bible is about the Messiah. In Revelation 19, also written by John, who knew Jesus, as we said, probably better than anyone else, uh, he took care of his mother until the day of her death. Both of their grave sites are still there in Ephesus today, but they are with the Lord, of course. But the interesting thing is that John wrote Revelation uh, when he was uh, exiled under Emperor Domitian, who reigned from 81 to 96 A.D., And he was put on the Isle of Patmos, if you've ever visited there, and I've been there many times. It's a very desolate, rocky place, and you can see why it would be an excellent prison or a place of exile. It was there that John received this marvelous message we know as the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people, when they read Revelation, they think of it as an event. Oh, it is an event, all right, when the Lord Jesus will come out of heaven and uh, on his thigh is the name written, Yes, our subject is the Messiah. Will you take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm chapter 2. Our Jewish friends greet us on the Shabbat with Shabbat Shalom, but it's only the Prince of Peace who can bring, bring Shalom, true Shalom to our hearts. Sometimes we say in a Messianic assembly, uh, Baruch Hashem Adonai Elohim Yeshua HaMashiach, Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus, our Messiah. In Psalm chapter 2, it is very, very clear that this is the issue of all issues. As a matter of fact, some folks ask me the question, do you have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah in order to be saved? And the answer is absolutely. There's a couple thousand guys down in Mexico named Jesus and they can't save you. Hello. (laughs) Psalm chapter 2, please. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare that he's the word of God, king of kings and Lord of lords. It is an event. But please don't misunderstand. The title of the book of Revelation is not an event. The correct title is out of chapter 1, verse 1. It's the revelation or the unveiling, the apocalypse, the disclosure of Jesus Christ. There's more about Jesus Christ in Revelation in terms of names and facts than you'll find in all of the Gospels. He's also quite different in the book of Revelation than he is uh, in the Gospels. And uh, that amazes people. There are more names given to him in Revelation than all the Gospels put together. But much of Revelation is simply a quote from the Old Testament. Uh, When I studied the book of Revelation and put a commentary together, I found 400 quotations from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Now that we have a lot of computer technology, a recent study lists 718 quotations from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. One writer says, 
uh, who's Jewish in background, says that it, it appears that outside of the names of the seven churches, there's hardly anything in Revelation that isn't found somewhere in the Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? My friends, we are here to talk about the revelation, the disclosure of Jesus Christ. Now, when you say Jesus Christ, that's not his first and last name. His name is Yeshua. Yahweh is salvation. Thou shalt call his name Yeshua, or the uh, correct form is Yehoshua. We say abbreviated Yeshua. It goes into Greek as Jesus and into English as Jesus. But uh, that name, Yeshua, uh, we're, we're not giving his last name when we say Christ. We're talking about the word Messiah, that he is the Messiah, the chosen one of Israel. Now, the Hebrew word for Messiah, Messiah, that he did write about, that ye might believe that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Yes, it's absolutely, absolutely essential that you believe that Yeshua, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, it's absolutely essential that you believe that he is the Messiah in order to be saved. Will you join me please in a moment of prayer as we begin. Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful word. And we realize that these are very critical times. And prophetically, we're drawing near to that sweet day when we'll be home. But we realize that there are so many in this world who have yet to bow the knee to him. But we recognize that whether we believe or not, all will bow the knee to him and all will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it is our sincere desire that we do it now that we might enjoy eternity with him. And Father, I pray that you'd move upon our hearts as only your Holy Spirit can do, and you would draw us to true, genuine faith, that we'd be born again of the Spirit of God and be made ready for heaven. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In the blessed name of our Messiah, our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. The subject that we're going to deal with, the prophecies of the Messiah, we've broken into four uh, categories that I want to give them for you at this present time, and uh, you can follow with us in our series. We're going to talk first of all about the existence of the Messiah. Decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. Now, will you turn, please, to one passage in the New Testament, John chapter 20. The Gospel of John, Yochanan writes in chapter 20 about the importance of believing that Jesus is the Messiah. On the Internet, the Jewish websites, the two questions that receive the most activity, one, who is a Jew? And the second one, who is the Messiah? Interestingly, on those Jewish sites, the sub-question to who is the Messiah, which is asked most frequently, is, is Yeshua the Messiah? Is Jesus the Messiah? Interesting, people are asking it more today than ever in the history of the world, as we understand it, and the information has come to us. In John 20, 30 and 31, John, who knew Jesus better than probably anyone did, he said, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, the 